Thank you very much also for uh, inviting me. Uh, I looked at the workshop program, it looks like very diverse. Um, so this, uh, which I'm really looking forward to. Uh, what I'm gonna be talking in this, uh, in this talk is uh, very much on the more theoretical side of trying to understand what is going on uh, with uh, uh, deep learning, focusing uh, uh, on, the, uh, on, uh, on optimization. We'll see in, in a bit uh, why. Uh, so I just want to mention this is joint work. Uh, this is based on a bunch of different pieces of joint work. Uh, the most part with uh, Benham Neishbor, who's uh, sitting here, uh, that I think pretty much everything I'm gonna talk about is uh, work uh, with, with Benham, which means Benham's work. Uh, and then uh, it's also based on work uh, with many other clubs, Ryota uh, and uh, uh, Ross and uh, many of the more uh, applied and experimental parts and more recent work with uh, Srinad and uh, Soraya, who Soraya is also here for the week and you can talk to her especially about the last bit of the talk. Okay, so let's start. So what I'm, what I'm uh, gonna be talking about is trying to understand uh, deep learning or really, I mean, what we're talking about is just learning with a uh, specific hypothesis class. So in the surface, it seems very simple. We have an hypothesis class. This hypothesis class of all functions we represent uh, using some architecture. So we have um, uh, a, a graph uh, defining uh, our architecture and some transition function. Um, do I actually, do I, I do have a slide, uh, I wasn't anticipating being the first one, so I was expecting at this point it'll be uh, old hat, should I? Okay, uh, is everybody here is familiar with what a feed forward network is? Excellent, good, good. <laughs> okay, um, so we have a fixed graph and all we can set is the weights and every setting of the weights gives us some functions, just defines the hypothesis class. So when, uh, and then we pick hypothesis from this class based on data. So really when you're talking about learning, there are three things roughly uh, that we need to understand. And looking at feed forward networks, uh, so one thing we need to understand is what is the capacity of this network, how, uh, uh, how uh, limited it is in, some, in the sense of how well can we uh, uh, generalize. I mean, if we, we need it to have uh, bounded capacity so we can uh, uh, generalize, in particular this helps us understand the sample complexity. And this, on the surface, we, we more or less understand. So there, uh, uh, um, this has been well studied, the, no the, the capacity is uh, roughly polynomial, uh, really the, if you want to allow infinite precision, it's more like quadratic in number of edges, uh, or maybe a, a bit less if you also bound the, the dimensionality. In more practical uh, terms, it's maybe closer to linear. But anyway, we have a, a pretty decent understanding of what is the capacity of uh, uh, feed for networks. If the network is of uh, bounded size, we can definitely uh, bound its uh, capacity and, and its sample complexity. Um, the reason I have, uh, almost understand is there's still some maybe gaps relating to uh, uh, this gap between linear and quadratic, although those are, I think at this point, almost completely closed. Uh, and also, as we'll see later, what we don't completely yet understand, although we're getting more understanding, is what happens if we also uh, impose restrictions on the, uh, on the weights. The other thing we want to understand is what kind of things can we present with this class? Can we represent interesting things? So uh, one thing we can say is, well, we can represent anything. So any continuous function can be approximated with a two-layer feed-forward network. But this is kind of completely useless because to represent a continuous function, we have to use a huge network. So the size of the networks increases exponentially with the, uh, with the dimensionality. Uh, and this is really not, I mean, which means that we're gonna need uh, a huge uh, exponential uh, uh, sample size, and this doesn't help us at all. The more uh, useful thing we can say is we can actually uh, point out that many specific functions we can represent using interesting networks. So if you go to talk to, and I think later on we'll hear talks by uh, people, by vision researchers and other researchers, then they can say that a lot of things can be represented by a hierarchy of uh, low level features on the bottom that can be captured by, uh, uh, by a, a few layers and then on top of that you combine them, you get other things, maybe it also simulates what's going on in our brain, so it really makes sense we can represent a lot of things. And that's uh, very nice, uh, but especially in this uh, building, or this institute, uh, uh, we can say something uh, much more than that, that we really don't need all these stories about interesting things being able to be present using specific networks, because we can know that anything we would possibly want to learn, so anything we can compute in, in uh, polynomial time and efficiently, we can also present using a small network. Okay? So this really means that in terms of, if you just look at the expressive power and the, uh, and the sample complexity, learning with a feed for all network is, uh, is the ultimate learning machine. Anything we would want to ever learn, so anything that's computable in polynomial time, if something is not computable in polynomial time, there's no point in learning it. 
we can actually represent using a small network, and we can learn it using a polynomial number of samples. And, and, and those polynomials are fairly small and well-behaved polynomials. So that means... That can be T log T, I believe, unless there's something weird about gravity. Uh, that should be T log T, you're right. So there's a tilde, uh, sorry, there's a tilde missing here. No, T log T, not T squared. Oh, no, it's T squared because I'm, I believe it is T squared because, uh, okay, so I have to admit that uh, I'm going to completely defer to Sanjeev here because this is, uh, uh, I will, I mean, what? T log T. So the thing is that you need the, uh, for any time T commutable function, you need T depth and you also need, a more efficient circuit. We can talk. Okay, sorry. Okay, so, okay, this is also true. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so, thank you very much. Uh, so, so, this is uh, this is why it's good to give these talks here because you know these are definitely things outside of my. So, uh, so, it's, so even better. <laughs> uh, thanks for the correction. I'll, I'll definitely should correct this. And then the point is that. Uh, uh, we can really represent anything efficiently, so we can, if we could actually train these things, they'll be ultimate learning machines. Uh, the only problem, of course, is that we can't. And this is the main thing uh, uh, we don't understand here. And it's not surprising that we can't just uh, by, um, if, just because if we could, we could actually learn any, anything, and we know uh, that subject to uh, very mild uh, assumptions, that's uh, not the case. And we also have uh, uh, results that tell us exactly just how hard it is. So even if we're just learning, uh, trying to learn functions representable by a, sing by a uh, neural net with a single hidden layer and a very, very small, any, I think it's SEO logarithmic, but it's really any super uh, uh, constant uh, number of units, uh, that's already, uh, uh, hard to learn uh, computationally subject to, so each one of these results is diff based on a different uh, uh, complexity assumption, um, uh, but uh, subject to reasonable or maybe semi-reasonable complexity assumptions, it's uh, uh, hard to learn even really tiny networks. So even if we know the network is, ex the, the function is exactly representable using uh, a very, very simple network, it's hard to learn it, and it's hard to learn it even if we allow much, much larger networks to learn it. Okay, if we try to learn using much larger networks. So in particular, this says that all this explanation of, oh, then our function is very, e very nice to learn with neural nets because it's represented, representable using uh, you know, low-level features and high-level features and very natural to represent using a neural net. All this doesn't tell us anything at all about w the fact that we can actually learn it using neural nets because we know that even that's the case, we still, in the, we still have uh, these results that tell us that does not justify why we can learn it. So there's a really um, a, a big mystery here uh, because in particular, if we look at the last five years or so, there's a huge success in actually learning uh, using neural nets. And we don't, I would claim we have absolutely no, no idea, uh, no understanding how, why that's possible. And again, I want to emphasize, that, so th there appears to be some magic property of reality, magic property of things we actually encounter in practice that makes them learnable using neural nets. And this property is not that there can be a present, that whatever it is that we're after can be presentable by small neural net. So if you go to uh, uh, your favorite uh, uh, vision or speech or, or uh, natural language researcher and ask them, oh, why are neural nets good for your uh, uh, data? And they say, oh, they're great because you know, in the visual uh, data you can represent things, they really represent things naturally using neural nets. You have these low level features and high level features and, and so forth. You can say, okay, that's great, but that doesn't provide me any explanation. All that tells me is the function is representable by a neural net, which I kind of already knew is the case for anything interesting. It doesn't tell me at all nothing about why it is that I can actually learn it, okay? Um, and so this is a very long introduction to why, uh, from my perspective, the main mystery here is optimization, okay? Is, is actually uh, uh, how come we can actually uh, uh, optim, train these uh, neural nets. Okay, so let's, uh, okay, this is the slide I promised you, so let's, uh, uh, let me just skip it. Uh, so uh, what we're gonna look uh, at this talk is try to, uh, try to understand what's going on here, and in particular, what we're gonna be revisiting is not only the computation aspect uh, and the optimization aspect, but also a better understanding really where, where is the capacity control and generalization coming from, because as all, so, so we already saw that there's a big mystery in terms of optimization here, how come we can optimize? And what I'm gonna actually try to convince you is that the optimization is related not only to this bullet of how come we optimize, but also to the capacity control, okay? And to try to uh, convince any of that, um, I'm gonna show you an experiment uh, we did. 
So what we did here is we took data. This is either CIFAR10 or M, Benham, what is it? Is it CIFAR10 or MNIST? This is MNIST, okay? We tried this in uh, several different data sets. The behavior is uh, similar. Uh, and we trained, the network, we trained the network with a very simple network with a single hidden layer uh, and increasing size, increasing size of the number of hidden units. So each one, and when I clarify, each, this is not a training curve as a function of time. Each one of these points corresponds to completely separate training on increasingly large networks. And so what can we see? Well, first of all, the training error decreases. I mean, that's not surprising. The network becomes, you know, the hypothesis the becomes richer, the approximation error drops. We can approximate the, the data better and better. Also, um, the optimization maybe becomes easier uh, when, uh, when there's more degrees of freedom. Uh, but this is not surprising. But let's look at the test error. That's more interesting here. So the test error also drops initially. And again, this is not surprising. Because we would expect, as, as you know, we're fitting the, the data better, the approximation error decreases, and the test error should uh, also decrease with it. The question is, what happens here? Okay. Uh, how did you we, did, we didn't. We did. We We trained. That's a good question. We'll come to that to it later. We trained to convergence. So what we did here, just to clarify the training, we just what we're doing here is just minimizing the training error or more accurately, the, uh, the, the training softmax loss, okay? Uh, and we're just optimizing it to convergence using, okay, we tried a bunch of different ways. There's very small differences between them. I don't know if this plot, it's, we tried both various SGD momentums and also batch conjugate gradient descent uh, just to make sure we're actually definitely converging uh, to a minimum of the training error, okay? What's the unit of the error? Is it, uh... So error I'm plotting here, okay, so this is, Although I'm, we're minimizing a softmax uh, error, this error is actually just misclassification error. Okay, uh, the, it tracks the softmax pretty well. But I want to so over here when it's zero, yeah, so this is uh, okay. We're getting into points which are important technical points. We'll see later on. So the, at this point, the data is separable. So the, the misclassification errors are just exactly zero. Okay, which means we know we're in the global minimum because we're just optimizing the training error. So first of all, we know we're actually succeeding in optimizing. And second, the softmax error, of course, is, is always positive. It's never gonna be exactly zero, but we can uh, drive it to zero. Once, it's, once the data is separable, we can drive it to zero just by, con by uh, basically increasing the weights. And we continued optimizing quite a lot. So until the, the softmax error was like 10 to the minus eight or something like that. Okay, so I don't, that answers, okay. Um, okay, so anyway, the big mystery is what happens here. So if we go back to our classic understanding of learning, then we're using a fixed hypothesis class, uh, hypothesis class of things representable by network with you know, whatever number of units. Uh, the, initially, the approximation error drops. Now the approximation error is already zero. Okay, there's no more approximation error. Uh, but as we increase this, the capacity of the class increases. And so the estimation error should increase. So what we should start seeing here is that the error should start increasing and behaving something like this, okay? So initially, and even, that, even more, worse than that, so uh, it should start increasing, and eventually it should start overfit, and we should overfit completely wildly because when we're talking about 1,000 uh, hidden units, so I don't actually remember the number of data points used here, but with 1,000 or 2,000 hidden units, there are way more parameters than, uh, uh, than data points here. So we, can, we should be com completely overfitting and getting completely junk, okay? Um, so this is what we should expect. This is kind of the curves we show people in the you know, first or second lecture in machine learning. Uh, but when we actually do this, then what we observe is something very different. What we observe is, okay, is this. Okay, so this is the, the true behavior. The training error continues dropping. So the two things are kind of crazy here. One is that the training error continues dropping quite significantly after the test error does not drop at all. Okay? Uh, and again, even though the, the approximation doesn't drop, the capacity only increases. Uh, and the second is that it never wildly overfits. So even if we allow the network here to be much, 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 much bigger, okay, the training error at some point stops decreasing, but it never increases. In our, in our experiments, it can depend on data sets. Some data sets increases a bit, but it never kind of overfits uh, wildly. And this is consistent also with what people are seeing in much bigger networks. Just a second, Shai. Uh, in much bigger networks, in more complex networks, where we routinely fit, the, uh, uh, fit networks with many more parameters than number of data points without any explicit regularization, and yet we do not have overfitting. Yes, Jeff, oh wait, no, sorry, Shai was first, I'll get to you. Jeff, Shai? You know, if the, if the decision surface changes, so maybe you increase the number of units, but you still have the same. Well, the decision surface, the, the, so over here, the decision surface definitely changes because my training error decreases, my uh, test error decreases. Right. Once it's oh, over here, the decision surface changes? Probably not. 
I, I, uh, they were thought they would not be increasing in overfitting. If no, but why, why doesn't it decrease? So if I train with, uh, with 10,000 units, so remember this is, I'm not taking, training this gradually. I just train a network with 10,000 units. How come I don't overfit? What, what causes me to get to, to actually be able to generalize, right? If you fit a class with, right, okay? Yes, Jeff. The question is, if, if you plotted the x-axis in terms of total amount of compute time that it took to train a model of that many number of hidden units, would the training time still increase? That's a good question. Uh, well, the training time would increase. The training number of steps, is, so the training time would definitely increase because just I mean, the, the, the number of iterations, sorry, the number, sorry? Number of flops. Oh, number of flops would definitely increase because just handling these, you know, each forward backward is much, much more expensive. Whether the number of uh, steps of, you know, whatever optimization method will. No, the total row time would definitely increase. Yeah, definitely. Okay, okay, so what's going on here, okay? Um, so, uh, uh, so this is the second kind of question uh, we want to understand. So again, we have two big mysteries relating to optimization and feed-forward networks. One is how come the optimization all converges to a global minima, okay? Because for all we know, it shouldn't, okay? It's a local search should not always converge to a global minima, or at least, you know, a, a good minima. And the second is, uh, where is the capacity control actually coming from? What, what is actually giving us this really nice capacity control and really nice generalization ability, even with number of parameters is wildly bigger than number of training examples? Okay, so in order to answer these questions, what we're gonna do is go back uh, to my, it's kind of embarrassing, to my PhD thesis that Sanjeev mentioned before. Uh, so uh, I came, I started dealing with neural nets uh, only fairly recently, Russell, is Russ here already? Russ should be here. Not yet. Okay, so Russ uh, Sokolnikov uh, uh, and, uh, and actually Benham uh, uh, dragged me into uh, deep learning. Benham, uh, early on in his PhD, went to, uh, to my office and said, Nati, I, I mean, I did all kinds of other stuff, but I really want to do deep learning. So I figured out how uh, to work in deep learning and also Russ. Um, but really, the only thing I know how to do, how I understand, I really understand is metrics factorization, okay, which I've been working on for a while. Luckily, um, uh, metrics factorization is deep learning. Okay, so metrics factorization is, <laughs> really? <laughs> Why is everybody laughing? Okay. <laughs> okay, so metrics factorization is deep learning, okay, and I've been doing it all the time, long before many of you, okay? So metrics factorization is deep learning, it's just deep learning with two layers and linear transfer, okay? So, so it's very easy, very simple deep learning, okay? <laughs> but, okay, so, so first of all, let's see uh, uh, why, why that is, right? So metrics factorization, we're looking at a, uh, uh, learning metrics W through a factorization UV, but if you think of U as, the, as V as the uh, weights in the first layer and U as the weights in the second layer, then the function just computes a linear function WX where W is factorized into UV. Okay, so this is deep learning, really, and, and this is deep learning in a really useful way. Why is that? So it's the, it's this point where it's, um, we actually understand deep learning fairly well. So both, you know, I've, uh, definitely it's nice for me because I've been working it for a while so I can actually write papers on this. But also as a community, we actually understand deep, uh, we actually understand some metrics factorization fairly well. And I would argue that even though you all laughed, this is already, uh, has many of the complexities of deep learning. Okay, in particular, it's a non-convex model, okay? And it's the most complicated deep learning model we actually understand, okay? So what we wanna do is actually start from here Okay? And then uh, try to push understanding beyond uh, metrics factorization also to models that you're not gonna laugh at when I uh, present them. And, and I should say that we'll see, it, but today we've already done that in at least in intuitive ways that we actually can uh, uh, leverage this and, and, um, uh, and this is some work uh, uh, with Russ. We're taking intuitions from metrics factorization, applying them to more complicated networks. Okay, but what we're gonna uh, be trying to do today is understand those two phenomena on the, this type of deep learning, metrics factorization. Yes? So there's multiple outputs? Okay, so the way, uh, this is rough intuition, so the way I wrote it here, there are multiple outputs, okay? Uh, if there's a, uh, yeah, if there's a single output, it doesn't make uh, too much sense, okay? Uh, okay, and in particular, uh, the number, uh, when talking metric factorization, one simple model for metric factorization is rank constrained uh, factorization, and then uh, the rank corresponds to the number of hidden units, okay? Um, Okay, so now the problem, the thing is that as I said, uh, metric structurization also has, so actually, I'm, when did I start? How, uh, where is Sanjeev? Yeah, you're only 15 minutes in. Uh, what? You're only 15 minutes in, yeah. It's also 15 minutes left then, okay, or a bit more, 20 minutes left, okay, excellent. Uh, okay, so, uh, uh, 
So in particular, these are non-convex models. And finding, a, at least if we bound a number of units, then learning a low rank matrix is already hard. Hard both in the sense that it's a non-convex surface with, in the worst case, many local minima, and in the sense that it's uh, NP hard to actually uh, test if the data was generated using a, a low rank uh, model, or to complete it, or to learn it, or hard to learn it in, uh, in uh, um, Improperly, hard in any way uh, you would like. Okay, uh, okay. So, but looking at metric structurization, uh, we know how to work not only with a rank, which is just looking at how many units we have, uh, but also with the norm bounded factorizations. So the idea here is that. Uh, instead of bounding the rank, which bounds the number of hidden units, okay, what we know how to do is work, uh, is instead bound the, the magnitudes of the weights. So this is captured by various norms. The simplest one maybe to understand is the trace norm or, or nuclear norm. So the nuclear norm, uh, if you're thinking of it as the terms of the sum of the singular values, then forget about that. That's not, not very useful here. Uh, if you're not thinking of that, if you didn't understand that last statement, then good for you. Uh, sorry, Miriam. <laughs> so, um, so what the, the trace norm is, is just uh, the, uh, the Frobenius norms of, the, uh, of U and V are just, in other words, the, the, uh, the norm of all the weights in the system. Okay, or, or if you're looking at the Frobenius norm for W, it's just the minimum of all these, uh, of the Frobenius, all, all the weights in the system, all the squared norms in the system, and the, the best way of representing this function. So uh, what's the, um, uh, what's the advantages of the nuclear of the trace norm? So the trace norm, uh, there, there are two ways to justify it. Uh, one way, uh, which uh, goes from my perspective at least to uh, uh, Miriam's uh, uh, work, and uh, uh, which is that it's a convex. You can think of it as a convex relaxation on the rank. Okay, uh, and there may be other norms that are maybe even better convex relaxations on the rank. Um, so it's, you can relate it to the rank. It's easier to optimize since it's convex. You can even write it uh, uh, as a semi-definite program, which is good if you're working with things up to size like 100 by 100 or something like that. But uh, even if we're working with much uh, bigger systems, we understand that even if, if, if you're minimizing the trace norm and working over uh, the UV representation, there are no, uh, no spurious local minima, at least if dimensionality is large enough. Um, so it's, it's very easy to work with. So you can think of it just as a more computationally easier alternative to the rank. Uh, but actually, I would argue, and this is how I first uh, came across it, is that uh, the trace norm also in, in induces its much better hypothesis class, and indu induces a much better inductive bias. Uh, why is that? So you can think of uh, bounding the rank as bounding a number of factors that explain your data. So if you think of something like the simplest maybe example is uh, metrics, uh, uh, movie ratings. So if you're looking at, fact at uh, models with rank four, that means there are only four things that determine how much you like movies or not. If you're thinking of things with bounded trace norm, that means that you're allowing an unbounded, maybe infinite number of things that determines how, you, how much you like movies, but roughly speaking, their overall influence is bounded, right? So their, their magnitude of the norms is bounded, and you can formalize it even a bit, a bit better, which means that you know, there may be very, a few very important factors, like how violent the movie is or, or something like that. That's a very important factor in terms of how, how well people like movies, but also many others. So factor number 20 or number 30 might be how nice is the music, how, how beautiful is the scene, Scenery, that also determines how much you like movies, but with a small influence. Okay? And this is the type of models we're allowing here. Okay, so we have two competing uh, forms of inductive bias. Now, let's try to understand that plot we saw where the training error was actually decreasing instead of, the test error was decreasing instead of increasing. So suppose uh, we did the following thing, and this is actually very close to how we train metric structurization models. We learn by uh, limiting the rank so rank K. So this is what we did before. We constrain number of hidden units, which means we're limiting the rank. And suppose we actually are also minimizing the, uh, we're, looking, we're minimizing the trace in the in norm, subject to a constraint that, the, that the, this is the training loss is zero. Okay? So it's reasonable to, let's just focus on this regime here when the training loss is zero, because that's also where the interesting stuff really happened before, when the training loss was also zero. So we're minimizing the training error, but not just minimizing it, not just sending it to zero, among all the, all the models with zero training error, we're choosing the one that minimizes the, uh, the trace norm. Okay? So now let's see what, what happens here. Um, what happens when you increase the rank? So when we increase k, when we increase the allowed rank, the rank of the resulting model definitely increases. And we'll always you know, take advantage, or at least monotonically, none decreases. Well, and generally, would be, uh, things will be full rank. So our resulting model is more complex in terms of the rank. And so it's kind of in the higher capacity class. And if we're relying on the rank for complexity control, we should be starting to overfit. But what happens to the trace norm? 
So as we increase k, the trace norm monotonically decreases, monotonically non, the, is monotonically non-increasing, right? Because if we can get some you know, trace norm seven, uh, if we can get a trace norm you know, 50 with, with uh, rank seven and I allow rank eight, I can definitely also have the same trace norm 50, but maybe now there's even a solution with a smaller trace norm. So the trace norm monotonically decreases. And so if we're thinking of the trace norm as a form of capacity control, okay, and, we can, uh, and we can actually justify how the trace norm is a good form of capacity control, and then the model actually becomes simpler, it becomes simpler in terms of norm. And so if the real inductive bias here is not the rank, but the trace norm, the model actually becomes uh, 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 easier, uh, becomes, uh, generalizes better as the rank increases. Okay? Uh, and, and this is actually what, what we see really in practice. So the only caveat is in practice, we don't completely, we don't really set this to zero, minimize some combination of the trace norm and, and, the, and the error. But we really do see that as we increase, as we continue increasing the rank, we get better and better generalization because the trace norm is continuing to decrease. Okay? Um, we see this across many different uh, uh, type of uses of, uh, uh, of the trace norm. So, yes? So you're thinking of allowing different dimensionalities in W? I mean, that different, would... different rank. Not the, so, okay, so different dimensionalities of U and V. Okay, so this is here, this does not refer like at exactly experiments I had before. So, this is the thing of the uh, fitting, uh, metri fitting a metrics, for example, you know, Netflix type uh, data. With, uh, with, fixed with, with fixed number, right? And just, well, it's not a fixed number of parameters because when you increase k, the number of parameters increases. So fixed number of input and output dimensions, but it's not a fixed number of parameters. Okay, because, okay, yes. In your introduction, you were saying that really the, the secret is in the nature of the data and not in, in the algorithm. Right, so here I would say, no, I'm not going in a different direction because I'm saying that what really makes uh, these things work um, is, in, at least in metrics recognition, why do we succeed in predicting Netflix? So I'd say the reason we succeed in predicting Netflix is not that our metrics of, uh, the real metrics of user ratings is low rank structure, but that the real metrics of user ratings has low trace norm structure, and if something has low trace norm structure, you can both learn it efficiently and generalize well. Okay, so it's a, I mean, it always is a combination of both, right? You can, okay? Okay, so let, let me just uh, continue, maybe we'll go back to questions later. Okay, so this, <laughs> he didn't the hear the. Right? <laughs> so, uh, uh, you have this constraint on the rank, uh, and, and you make it increase. But uh, so I mean, I, I see where you're coming from and what your story. Yeah. But you know, I could put the number of non-zero entries in double even tell exactly the same story, right? That's true. So right. So so no no not not instead not instead of k instead of the trace norm. Yeah. So I, I'm minimizing no. the trace norm. I've decided I'm going to minimize the trace norm. Why should the the? Ah uh, no no because the rank because this corresponds. Okay sorry. So this exactly corresponds to the experiment I showed you at the beginning where I increase number of hidden units. Number of hidden units is the rank. So the, the, the experiment you should be thinking of, the mental experiment you're doing here, is you're fitting a network with increasing number of hidden units, where k is number of hidden units, right? And as you allow more and more hidden units, you're getting better generalization, which is exactly what we did in the beginning. And what, I, the, way, uh, the reason I'm telling you this might be happening is because the real capacity control comes from something else, like the trace norm. Now you're telling me, oh, maybe it's not, I thought you were telling me, maybe it doesn't come from the trace norm, maybe it comes from sparsity of the representation. That's possible. Or maybe it comes from some other norm. But that, that definitely is possible. I'm not arguing that the trace norm is the real thing. What I'm arguing is the rank is not the real thing. The capacity control is not coming from the rank. It comes from something else, which increasing the rank, increasing number of hidden units allows me to drive it lower. Is that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, so now there's, uh, there's only one problem here, uh, which is what I assume what uh, this was based on is the fact that the way I train is by minimizing the trace norm. But the way uh, I actually told you uh, we train is by, uh, by just minimizing the, um, minimizing the, trace, the, the training error. Uh, so um, what's, I mean, in order to understand uh, if this is uh, uh, really, this improvement is explained by, by improved norm, we can actually try to measure it. So what we did, this is the same plot I showed before, I'm just showing just the training error here, and the, just the test error where the training error is all zero. And now we can track the norm and see, does the norm actually decrease? If the norm decreases, that actually helps me justify that I'm actually generalizing through having smaller norm. So who thinks, that, so what I'm gonna plot is the kind of the this sum of the square of all the weights in the system, just the norm kind of the, of the network. Who thinks it's gonna increase? You have to vote. Who thinks it's going to increase? Jason, who thinks it's going to decrease? Okay. So Jason was right. 
okay? <laughs> Uh, so uh, the norm increases. So this seems like I'm, I'm, all my explanation before was completely bogus, okay? Because okay, it would have been a nice explanation, except that this is not, that doesn't hold by reality because the norm actually doesn't increase. And so now we have to see what exactly norm I'm plotting here. So I said the norm I'm, I, I said I'm plotting is just the sum of all the the sum of the squares of all the weights in the system, okay? And that's one possible norm. That's not actually a very good norm. Why is that not a very good norm? Really, what we're trying to capture here is to capture the no, the how complicated a function computed by the, ne by the network is. Uh, but let's consider this setting of the weights, okay? So this setting of the weights, and, and think of real activation, yes? Question, uh, when you say improved generalization, I don't actually see improvement on that graph. It's the red, no, the, the test error, the red is the, is the test error. The red is improving. Um, the test error is, is dropping. It looks identical, more or less, right? It's Here? Like, this looks no, identical? <laughs> oh no! Yeah, yeah. At some point, it flat at some point it flattens. But also, in, in over here, the norm is still increasing. It's definitely not decreasing. Oh, it's definitely not. Let's agree that it's not decreasing at least. No, so it's a, exactly the point. If my network memorized everything, I would not in, be, see increase in generalization performance. If my network mem Once it memorizes everything. No, but why? Why is it decreasing it here? Why is this decreasing? Okay. So there are two kind of things. Why is it? Why is it decreasing here? Okay. And, and then also I could ask, why is it flat here? Because if I'm, if I'm continuing to memorize, okay, and this increases, and we'll go back to that in a second, then, then I should start overfitting. If I memorize, I'm going to overfit. But it's already overfitting. No, it's not overfitting. Look at this. It's just decreasing. It never increases. Maybe we should let you okay. fit it. Yeah, yeah, let me, okay. Okay, let, let me, I'll, I'm going to. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Yes. But when you have more weights than the uh, number of examples, yes. the set of solution is not one. Exactly. Exactly. So, so, so okay, Leon, let's, yeah, that, of course, of course, of course. That's okay, that's the last slide of the talk. You're <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Leon doesn't need this talk because he already, uh, I mean, uh, uh, this is a, a usual experience when I tell something to Leon and he already knows the end. So, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, Okay, uh, let me just, I'm sorry, but I wanna continue uh, with the talk, so we'll get back to the questions later. Okay, so, so why is this maybe not a good norm? So the thing is that I have, an, what, what I can do is since the ReLU is homogenous, I can just scale uh, all, the, all these weights. Okay, so what happens here is this is a function that has very high norm, norm about 200. But if I just scale the, all these weights by, uh, down by 100 and these up by 100, I get a network that computes exactly the same function but it has much, much smaller weight. Um, you know, norm, norm, order one norm, norm, uh, what is this, three point something, okay? Um, and so it seems that although these two uh, networks can be exactly the same function and should really logically, should, I mean, morally should have the same complexity, if I look at this norm, it gives me really different answers, okay? So what we would really ideally like is a measure of complexity that is invariant to these invariances, to rescaling the weights this way. Okay. And we can come up with such measures. One such measure, which I don't want, I can give you an entire talk on this, or Benham can give you an entire talk on this, or Donald Dillon, this is the path norm. Uh, so the main, the path norm is give you, the definition is just, the, it's the sum over all the weights in the network of the product of the weights along, uh, the sum over all the paths in the net from input to output of the product of the weights along the path. Uh, it's exponential definitions, but it can be computed efficiently in using dynamic programming, and we can work with this efficiently. Uh, the main important thing is it's invariant to such transformations. Okay? And we can also get uh, uh, capacity control in terms of it. Uh, and now, if we do the exact same plot, but instead of plotting this uh, overall L2 norm, plot the path norm, we do get a nice decrease. Okay? And now we, we, we can say that, okay, we do ha start to get an understanding of what might be going on here. The, the, the norm, the, the, uh, the improve, improved generalization is because we're actually fitting a, a simpler model. Simpler in what way? Simpler in that it has smaller, not that it has smaller rank or smaller number of units, but simpler in that it has smaller norm, like the path norm. And again, I'm not claiming that path norm is the right answer here. We also experimented with some other norms. You can get this behavior also so from, for some other uh, uh, invariant norms. Uh, I think there was a bit of a data switch going on here. You, you, you started by telling us that the norm you want is the product of the Frobenius norms across layers, and then uh, which okay. was the trace norm? Okay, so the trace norm, no, to some, okay. But actually, the example that you gave, this actually cancels the rescaling that you had. So, okay, wait, so that's, that's important, that's a good point. So first of all, the trace norm, although I defined it uh, that way, can also be defined, uh, and that, that's maybe the more, 
uh, the definition that's actually more frequently used in optimization is just the minim minimum over all factorizations of the squared Frobenius norms. So this more directly corresponds to what I plotted you. So this is the trace norm of W. Okay. And the second is I would get the same thing if I just plotted if I just plotted the Frobenius norm a few times the Frobenius norm of V, I would also get the same thing. It's true that I can represent the trace norm in other ways. In fact, the path norm is inspired by one of the ways of representing the trace norm. The important thing here is it really important which norm on, on the weights you're using. Okay. So I'm confused. Okay. Multiple trace norms that are called the same thing. Uh, no, 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 no. It, there are multiple definitions for the trace norm. So the trace norm is a norm on W. Okay. And there are various ways of writing it in terms of u and v. So the important thing here, which it, it is, this is a very important point, and we'll get to it, well, I hope to get to it later, but I'm not going to get to it, is what are you calculating the norm of? Are you calculating the norm of the weights, which are really u and v, the weights in the system, or are you calculating the norm of the functions being computed, which is more analogous to w? And this is an important thing we're trying to push here, that ideally you want to get closer and closer to computing the, the, the norm of the function being computed and not of the specific weights that are presenting it. Okay, uh, so just a word about memorization. Another thing you can say, and this goes back to Misha's uh, question about memorization, there is a recent paper by um, uh, Ben Recht, Moritz Hart, uh, and uh, I know some other people who might be here. And, uh, no, no, but none of the authors is here. Uh, and uh, what they showed is that you, if you train a network, you can uh, successfully, the demonstration of the fact we were talking about that the, that the size of the network does not bound capacity, is that you can train anything. You can train junk labels uh, and still completely fit junk labels, which really shows that the network has infinite capacity and, and maybe is memorizing, like Misha said. So what we can look at is what happens to the norm, in particular to the path norm, as we're training using real labels or using junk labels. Okay? So the red is junk labels and the blue is real labels. And as we can see here, this is kind of memorization behavior we would expect. If, the norm, if this norm really captures capacity, the capacity increases polynomially as, uh, as we increase the number of uh, training points because we're memorizing. But if we're training using real data, then initially there's an increase Okay, we're really training maybe more complex model, but then it just flattens out because you know we already trained the function. It's not more complicated to train using more examples. Okay, but let's uh, yes. Uh, is that you estimate that by MCMC techniques or how do you estimating what? P. No, by uh, dynamic programming. Dynamic programming. Is it's exactly you estimate exactly using dynamic programming. Uh, not estimated, I calculated exactly as narrow programming. Okay, uh, now I'm really running out of time, I think, so I'll try to uh, be quick. So, okay, but there's still a mystery here. I mean, I, what I told you is what would happen if we would minimize this path norm, but we're not minimizing this path norm. All this is just done by training, which is just both of these plots, just by optimizing the training error, okay? So if we look in particular at uh, this particular plot with a, a thousand training points, what we're seeing here is that we are indeed getting small path norm, which does correspond to small test error. But actually, there are many other ways, as uh, uh, Leon pointed out, of fitting uh, this, the training data, uh, which do not have small trace norm. Okay, sorry, would not have small path norm. Okay, so I could actually fit the training data with a much higher norm. And what we did here is actually, we screwed with optimization algorithm to intentionally make it bad. Okay, so in, in bad in what way? It still finds a global optimum. Okay, so it's still good. It's an optimization algorithm. Okay, all of these correspond to zero training error. Okay, so all these correspond to optimization algorithms which do the right thing if you only think in terms of optimization. They find a global a minimum. But these global minima that we force the system to find have much higher uh, path norm and indeed correspond to much worse uh, test error. Okay, we can get a test error to be uh, essentially one. Okay, so completely uh, random. So. The real mystery that's going on here is to say, okay, maybe we understand capacity control now in terms of the norm, but how come the optimization algorithm, so to get this, we didn't do anything special. We just ran gradient descent. How come the just running gradient descent actually finds you a small path norm solution or a small norm solution? Again, I'm not claiming the path norm is the right one. Um, so where is the regularization actually coming from? Uh, so, and this is the main thing we kind of don't understand here. So there seems that there's a tight connection here between optimization and, and generalization in that the, I would argue that, as Don said, the optimization algorithm is actually what drives the generalization. And we understand that fairly well for convex models. So there's been, over the past decade, we've had, uh, 
uh, my group and as a community, lots of work on understanding uh, the connection between optimization and generalization in convex models. And we understand that we can relate specific optimization algorithms to specific uh, uh, measures of capacity control, specific uh, implicit uh, specific forms of implicit regularization, mostly in the form of early, early stopping or you know, uh, uh, online learning or one pass uh, learning. And this comes from by, by essentially choice of geometry, which controls both optimization algorithm and generalization. So for convex models, we understand this very well through early stopping, essentially. Okay? But what we're seeing here is that in, in these non, is in under, way underdetermined non-convex models, we're not doing early stopping, but we're still seeing uh, this type of connection. The optimization algorithm is still biasing us to a specific uh, global optimum. Okay? And, um, and now the big question here is, um, what is, you know, how is the optimization algorithm bias against towards a specific global optimum, and what is this bias? And how can we relate between the optimization algorithm and the bias? And in particular, the reason this is really interesting is because if we change the optimization algorithm, that will also change the bias. So can we get a better bias by changing the optimization algorithm? And now I'm gonna, how, when do I need to finish? By? Yeah. Now, so. Around now, oh wow, I just got to the technical part. Okay, so, we've been so, asking questions. You can take another minute or so. okay, so, <laughs> okay, so let me just uh, fly through uh, uh, this really quickly. Um, so, so one thing we can do is we can change the geometry that the optimization algorithm is working uh, on. So gradient descent is typically the same respect to the Euclidean norm. If of the Euclidean norm, you use some other norm that maybe is better, like for example, maybe the path norm, uh, then we get, uh, uh, a, a better, uh, uh, a be maybe get a better optimization method. So this is exactly what we did here. And if you want to learn more about this, talk to ben uh, Benham, who's going to be here uh, all week. Uh, and so path SGD is just doing steepest approx. Now we have to approximate a bit, but think of it as steepest descent with respect to the path norm. Okay, instead of steepest descent with respect to the Euclidean norm, which we argued is maybe not so good here. Uh, and what we get is the following. So. Um, what we show you, these are training errors. These left to, this is the, the uh, softmax loss and the zero one error. And red uh, is uh, regular training path SGD and blue is, is uh, blue is path SGD and red is regular SGD. And what we're seeing here is two things. First of all, the optimization is better. It takes about half the time, but much more, but both of them find the global minimum. Okay, the thing is that the path SGD finds a better global minimum. Better in what sense? Not in terms of optimization. Both of them find a global minimum. Both of them have zero uh, training objective. Okay, uh, the difference is that the path SGD actually finds a global minimum that generalizes much, much better. Okay, and so again, what we did here is again going back to what Lon suggested by changing the optimization algorithm. We didn't just change how well we do the optimization, how well we minimize the objective. We changed the the implicit bias that's uh, induced here. Okay, and so really what. Um, uh, what you can, uh, uh, what, the way you can think about it is that we have this, you know, it's a way under over constrained problem, okay? So we have a lot of global minima. They all have zero error, okay? So these, these are the oceans that have zero objective value. We start on some mountain somewhere, okay, that has not high error. And now we're going to optimization algorithm. It's a local switch is going to guide us down until we get to a global minima, if we get to a global minima. Which global minima do we get to? Well, we're not going to get to the middle of the ocean. Okay, because we're just doing local search. So we're gonna get to some beach, but which beach are we gonna get to? If we're gonna start here, okay, we're not gonna get to a beach in New Jersey. Okay, we're gonna go and get to a beach somewhere you know, around here. So roughly, we're gonna get to the closest beach. Okay? But what does it mean, the closest beach? So this notion of closest goes back to which notion of geometry we're using. The notion of geometry that guides our local search is gonna tell us, define to us, which closest beach we're gonna get to. And then I would argue that the capacity control comes from the fact that we're really, our capacity is not all the world, but just everything inside the neighborhood that we actually are gonna get to uh, with our local search. Okay. Um, okay, so let me just tell you what I'm not gonna tell you. Uh, so, um, uh, so you said we're two big mysteries here. So, so we got to a good point because at least we understood the questions. I'm not going to have time to tell you the answers. Uh, so the two mysteries here, uh, for the needs to me are the biggest mysteries of deep learning, is one, how come local search succeeds in finding a global minima, which we consistently see empirically in many problems. Uh, and the second is, what is you know, how, why does it bias us towards low complexity models and what is, what is this bias and what is the relationship between the optimization algorithm and the bias? And to answer these two questions, so we don't, I have no answers on, on I have answers for these on, on my kind of deep networks, which is metrics factorization. So in metrics factorization, we now have some good answers to both of these questions. 
Okay. Uh, we there's um, let me just flash the um, uh, the results. So. Uh, um, uh, so we both understand how, uh, in, in many cases, if we do local search on the space of metrics vectorization, then we actually have no spur under certain assumptions no spurious minima, and we and, lo and local search does get us to global minima. Okay, I'm not going to have time to uh, uh, go over uh, uh, these results exactly, but the the rough idea is under the same conditions that you can learn using other more complicated. Methods you can also guarantee learning using local search, uh, and there's a, a string of nice uh, uh, papers on this coming out uh, recently with a, uh, with similar flavor. Uh, I can explain to you at length why our result is much uh, more interesting and more general and stronger than uh, Jason's and all the others, but um, but I don't have time to do that. Um, <laughs> so the, the the morally, what's the, the main thing that's uh, uh, that's going on here is again we have lots of understanding through through metrics mostly through metrics factorization problems of how does local search work in these highly non-convex problems. Okay? Uh, the other thing which is uh, um, uh, more interesting maybe is what is this uh, implicit bias coming from, and uh, we understand this very well. So for for least squares it's very easy to think why it's coming. So if you just do gradient descent on least squares. Uh, for way un so you do under constraint these squares and you're gradient descent, then you start from zero. You're gonna de you're gonna converge to a zero error solution because it's uh, under constraint. But not only to a minimum zero error solution, you're gonna converge to the minimum norm zero error solution. Minimum if you use gradient descent and then you clearly norm zero error solution. Okay, and this uh, this is a straightforward. Uh, uh, correlate of the fact that basically you're just staying in the span of the data, uh, but we really want to understand this also at, uh, uh, for metrics factorization. And so suppose, so you can think of, let me leave this as the uh, last kind of question. If you're minimizing a f uh, metrics factorization problem, minimizing over U and V without constraining the rank of U and V, so full dimensional U and V, and you're minimizing some objective, say a metrics completion objective. Okay, then what happens? So the problem is way underdetermined. You can completely fit the, the data while having zeros or anything else you want any, everywhere else because the, the model class is completely unconstrained. It's any metrics. But if you actually do gradient descent on U and V, you're not going to get to the solution. You're going to get to a solution that generalizes well. And I'll leave this as a mystery. We now understand why that happens and where do you converge to, or mostly understand. But let me skip that. Okay, hopefully, maybe you saw that here. And then just jump to the last slide, because um, I think way over time. Uh, so the main thing I, I tried to convince you today is uh, there's a lot we don't understand of deep learning. I think everybody uh, agrees to that. And I'd argue that a lot of, much of it stems from optimization, not only just why optimization works, but maybe more interestingly, how the optimization plays a crucial role in defining the inductive bias of the system and defining what is, what the learning actually is doing and, and giving us the effective capacity control. Uh, we are, we, and we don't understand that, understanding that is crucial. I would make a further leap, which is, a, uh, Hope they're not recording me now. This is completely unsubstantiated. Uh, there's also a tight connection. We, we talked about the beginning. That there's some magic property that makes it possible to learn, possible to optimize. I would further argue that there's a, there might be a strong link bec between the magic property that makes it uh, easy to optimize and the magic property that actually gives us good generalization performance, that actually gives us the effective uh, capacity control. Um, uh, but these are, and, and to understand these questions, uh, where if metrics factorization is an extremely powerful tool to, to start understanding them. Okay, I think that's. <laughs> yes, Sorry. Peter. Thanks oh. for a lovely talk. Okay. Maybe we'll take uh, questions in the. Oh, Sorry, should have interrupted. And, then. Uh, and uh, the next speaker is uh, Elad Razan. Uh, Elad uh, has been a leader in convex optimization and online optimization. Uh, he's been thinking about representation learning. Uh, so Do you want to ask something? Or? Uh, yeah, well, just a comment. So then, uh,